Hey everybody, this is So Heidi, and you're listening to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. We all know that the fashion industry is brutally competitive and it takes loads of hard work to get ahead. The problem is that everyone's secretive and tight lipped about their ways. After working as a designer and educator for over a decade, I wanted to help break down those barriers and bring you valuable knowledge from industry experts, and this show is exactly where you'll find that. Whether you're trying to break into the fashion world, make yourself more marketable, launch your own label, or become a successful freelancer, we'll help you get ahead in the cutthroat fashion industry. This is episode 39 of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast, and today I'm chatting with Kristen Allen. With no fashion background or experience, Kristen has spent the last three years learning the ropes of launching her own line of tops for women who are full busted. Kristen patiently and diligently worked directly with her audience and researched what her customer wanted to make sure her product fit right, used the perfect fabric, and was available in the right colors at the right price point. After this long journey of not only educating herself about how the industry works, what it's like to manufacture a product and work with factories, but also deeply understanding her customer, she recently started talking to factories in China to get her designs produced. In this episode, Kristen and I chat about how she slowly grew her network and found the right suppliers, her smart strategy of doing pop-up shops as a form of research and what she learned from them, and why it's worth it to hire an industry expert to make sure factories don't take advantage of you. As soon as you, uh, you know, approach these different companies, and, and this happened to me, they'll, they'll sell you a dream. They'll say, oh, yeah, we can do this work. Oh, yeah, no problem. Great. And then they give you something that's horrible. And then when you catch it, they look surprised that you caught it because I guess maybe they think, oh, you weren't supposed to catch it. You know, we, we didn't think that you knew anything. But what they didn't know is I might have been new to this business, but I knew to hire somebody to that know, really knows sewing and really knows manufacturing to look over and make sure that things are done right. Before we get on to the interview, I want to let you know about something new that is available within the Successful Fashion Designer Network. Just last week, I launched a Patreon page. Now, if you're thinking right away, oh, Patreon, she's just asking for me to give her money. That's absolutely not what it is. You can give a dollar or a couple dollars a month, but you don't have to. Everything on the Patreon page is available absolutely for free. And there are three things and three reasons why you may want to check out the Patreon page. One, the Patreon page is your exclusive way to hear about upcoming podcast guests and have the opportunity to ask industry experts your burning questions. You can put your questions for upcoming guests in Patreon, and I'll try to ask them during interviews. Two, there's a lot of stuff that goes on inside my head, stuff that I don't ever really get to talk about, from how I deal with anxiety and imposter syndrome to creative ways I've used and I've seen others use to work your way up and get the promotion you deserve or land a new freelance client. And Patreon is where I'll be opening up more about this stuff with short audio clips on my reflections about working in the fashion industry. The third reason you'll want to check out Patreon is for a lot of behind the scenes and bonus content. Mark and I capture a ton of content that doesn't really have a home. Like when we go on location and do a podcast interview, we do some extra video clips and do extra tidbits of interviews from industry professionals at trade shows. And like I said, they don't really always have a home. They're not always appropriate for the podcast. They don't really belong on the blog. And so Patreon is where I'll be releasing all of these bonus mini video segments and bite-sized interviews. You can check all of this out at patreon.com slash SFD. And again, everything's absolutely free. Uh, If you get in there, I would love to hear your feedback, what you love, what you don't love, what you want to see more of. It's a place where we're going to be experimenting with new content types talking more with you guys about what's going on behind the scenes and just having a little bit more of a dialogue back and forth. Again, check that out if you want to get questions answered for upcoming podcast guest interviews, some of my internal reflections on working in the fashion industry, as well as behind the scenes bonus video and interview content. All right. Now, as always, if you don't want to miss out on upcoming episodes, make sure to hit subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening. And I will also ask you that if you do enjoy this show, I would be so thrilled if you'd take 30 seconds to leave a rating or review on iTunes. It really helps out and I really appreciate it. You can do that at sfdnetwork.com slash review. 
Now, on to the interview with Kristen. To access the show notes for today's episode, visit sfdnetwork.com slash 39. All right. Well, welcome, Kristen, to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. Can you please start by introducing yourself to everybody and letting us know who you are and what you do in the fashion industry? Okay. Um, my name is Kristen Allen, and I am a founder and president of Exclusively Kristen, which is a clothing line specifically for full bust women. Um, and that's women who wear double D and higher bra cup. Um, currently, I do miss sizes, but I do have plans to go more into the plus size um, later on. Awesome. And uh, you know, I'm not really sure where we should start, but let's let's start here because in a conversation you and I just had literally two minutes ago as we were getting ready to <laughs> record the show, you made a comment to me about, you know, finding some information now that you wish you would have found four years ago in regards to maybe finding a sewer or someone to make your first samples or prototypes, or I don't even know where you were four years ago. Um, So why don't you start kind of with the beginning of your journey and what that looked like to launch your exclusively Kristen label? Okay. um, Well, it was uh, 2013. I had just moved to New York. Um, I have um, I had worked previously in higher education administration, and I was also a grad student, so I was a TA. Um, so I most of my career has been in higher education. But one thing that I always had trouble with was finding things to wear, um, whether it was in high school, you know, more age appropriate things that wouldn't freak my my parents out. And then when I went into the workforce, because I'm a full bust woman myself, I, at the time I was like a G cup. Now I'm more of a double H. Um, and I just couldn't find anything to wear. So I, I moved to New York and everybody in New York is a hustler. And I mean a hustler in a good way. <laughs> you know, they have multiple line streams of, of income. You know, they have all these big ideas. They have all these um, aspirations. You know, it wasn't like some, obviously, like some so, slow, sleepy town where everybody's just content where they are. Like, it seemed like everyone I met was going somewhere. And it really inspired me to, um, you know, put this idea in fruition that I'd had since high school, and that was to create a clothing line for full bust women um, that I found that some of the things that were more appropriate tended to be kind of old lady styles. Um, so, because I didn't really have a background in fashion, you know, I read the blogs and I, I read, you know, all these things on the internet, but nothing really prepares you for starting a business like real world experience. And one of the things that I noticed is that the best kept secret is where people get their things manufactured or their, their, or sewed. I, for the life of me, there was just like, where do I go? Who do I go? Who's good? Who's not good? I couldn't find anything. And the only time I had a recommendation was from someone I had hired to create my tech packs. And she had worked for a big fashion label. She's like, oh, yeah, we use this guy. But um, he wanted bigger orders. And I was just a small company. I didn't need, you know, a thousand pieces at the time. Um, And there's also um, websites that people can review, um, like uh, USA factories. And I went to a few of them and I wasn't really impressed with the work, even though they received review, like really good reviews. So I was wondering, you know, who's reviewing these companies and is it just the blind leading the blind because this website is specifically for startups. Um, So I didn't really know like who to trust or where to go to. Um, But I got really lucky. Um, I randomly met somebody who, had their own niche fashion label. They were making um, shirts, men's wear inspired shirts for women. And they said, you should go to this place. They've done great work for me. So to make a long story short, essentially like finding a good sewer is through word of mouth. And there's really a very limited way to find it just on your own, like through uh, playing on the internet. And so, so you found this like you randomly met somebody who referred you to somebody um, and your experience with the other people who you had kind of found online, you said was just you weren't getting the quality you needed and there was reviews, but it it just didn't, they weren't meeting up to what you were expecting. 
Yeah, and, and part of it thinks that um, it might have been because they could tell that I was new to the business. Mm. Now, I was lucky that the 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 good sewers that was recommended to me by by the founder of the menswear inspired women's shirts um they worked with um small businesses exclusively so it was a lot more hand holding and they also didn't try to take advantage of me which is a big thing um because as soon as you uh, you know approach these different companies and and this happened to me they'll they'll sell you a dream they'll say oh yeah we can do this work oh yeah no problem great and then they give you something that's horrible and then when you catch it they look surprised that you caught it because mm-hmm. i guess maybe they think oh you weren't supposed to catch it you know we we didn't think that you knew anything but what they didn't know is i might have been new to this business but I knew to hire somebody to that know really knows sewing and really knows manufacturing to look over and make sure that things are done right. So once I started catching things that were wrong, then I didn't really have as many problems with them. But by then, my you know my mouth was kind of sour, and I was like, I don't want to work with these people yeah. anymore. So, wow, that's a really interesting experience um, in terms of like you almost felt that they were specifically trying to take advantage of you because they thought you wouldn't know any better and they could just run you through really fast, collect your money, and then be done. Correct. Yes. <laughs> oh, that makes me really sad. So, yeah. So I always recommend to people starting out, you, you know, I know it's like hard when you're a startup and, you know, you're trying to save money, but it's worth spending a couple of hundred dollars to hire a consultant to just, you know, if, to check, you know, the sewing and, and to check the grading and then make sure that things are done properly. Because, I mean, if I had to sent those things direct to manufacture, I would have gotten, you know, a bunch of pieces and wasted a thousand dollars on stuff that I couldn't even sell. Yeah. So you so. found somebody to almost be like your quality control person before you pulled the trigger and going into production. Yes. And where did yes, you find was- them? Through, um, it was Elance at the time, but they've, I think they've changed their name to Upwork. I was looking for oh. a fashion, uh, like someone that can make tech packs. And this person happened to have graduated from, um, FIT. Okay. Um, so she was uh, young and looking for work and she did, you know, a great job on the tech packs. And so I, and then even the manufacturer that I work with was like, oh, this tech pack is really good. <laughs> um, so then, <laughs> and then she also had, she had worked for a big company as well. So she, you know, knew, clearly knew what she was doing. So I asked her, can you just come and I'll pay you an hourly rate to just take a look at these samples for me? Yeah. That's really smart because, um, you know, sometimes I feel like you can, like you said, it's worth investing the couple hundred dollars right there. I know when you're on a startup budget, it's money's really tight, but sometimes spending a little bit more money up front saves you from, like you said, spending a thousand or maybe even a couple thousand dollars on your your production getting done wrong. And then, then that's even harder to recover from, not just financially, but also emotionally. Yeah. And if you approach stores with that, I mean, if, if that's the case, you have to go direct to the consumer, which, you know, the margins are higher, but, um, you know, the consumers aren't stupid. And so they're going to look at the garment and say, well, you know, it's not the greatest. I mean, if it's priced correctly, then they may not even care. But, um, you know, you really limit yourself if you can't even approach stores and get that distribution because you have something that, you know, is going to ruin your reputation yeah. if you approach the stores with. So, yeah. Okay, so you um, you found the right uh, factory to do your production, and you had someone sort of helping you who had industry experience. And then, like, where are we at in the timeline? How long did that take you? And, and then sort of what came next? Okay, well, it actually took me, the first year was really tough um, because I, I was trying to go at it, you know, on my own. I was trying to save money. Um, but, you know, my grandpa, parents have a saying, you know, penny wise and pound foolish. <laughs> um, so by, but by the second year, that's when I really started having, because I had gotten a bad batch of, of, um, of clothes and I actually had to, to sell them on eBay. Mm. Um, so luckily I was able to break even. Um, but after that experience, I said, okay, I'm, ha- I'm just going to hire someone to look it over and I'm going to um, uh, focus more on the quality control mm-hmm. and really look for a good um, sewer and go from there. So um, 
I would say by year two is when I found that manufacturer that works with startups and they're great. Then they recommended me to a, a really good, um, fabric supplier that had a showroom in the city and they, they use Japanese fabrics, um, that for the quality that you get, they're very reasonably priced. And again, it's, it's, it seems like it's all word of mouth, mm-hmm. um, and how you get, and then I found another fabric supplier and then they said, Oh, you should use this trim. So I guess the advice that I would give people is a lot of the times your manufacturer, your sewers have worked with other brands and other companies. So they say, oh, yeah, this company, they use this trim supplier. They use this fabric supplier. Just ask them questions um, because obviously they want your business. They want you to do well because if you do well, then you go back to them and you order more. Um, So, I mean, just and also just getting into the networks and, you know, New York is, sort of the fashion mecca you know there's lots of fashion things going on so it's really easy to to network in new york but if you're not in new york you're in a smaller town um you know i would say go to the manufacturers and ask them like where do you usually get the fabrics from where do you get the trims from yeah um and i don't think you know because sometimes with other brands they're very you know protective of where they get their things from but with a manufacturer there's not so much yeah, no, and that's really great advice, and it's something that I've done over my um, over the years in my career quite a bit. Is I always ask my factories and my suppliers for their advice, their input, their expertise, their referrals, because they're the ones behind the scenes. Like you said, they know other people who can solve that problem for you, and they're maybe not as protective. They want to help um, because the better success you have, then you come back to them for more orders. And it's this nice revolving circle or revolving door of business. Um, So it's a great tip to sort of once you find one person that's working really well for you, kind of ask them and then that can just branch out into a ton of different resources. Um, So, okay, so you, by year two or so, you were kind of had gotten your uh, your ducks in a row, let's say, as far as like your fabrics and your factory, and you got your first batch of production. And then what happened then? I mean, were you thinking about sales and how do you sell? Do you sell direct to consumer? Do you do wholesale? Um, or is that even where we are in the timeline? I thought about wholesale, uh, but I really wanted to focus on Um, the direct-to-consumer as a fit model. And so what I did was I did a series of pop-up shops throughout the country um, in Brooklyn and San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, Chicago, like all these different cities across the country to get an idea before I approached the stores what they wanted and how my garments fit on them. Because I'm a fit model, but, you know, my body type is not everybody's body type. And so as a result, I made tweaks here to the pattern, tweaks there. Um, I added side slips so there's a little slits so there's a little bit more room in the hips for customers that have a little bit larger hips than I do. Um, and then from there, that's probably like year two, year three, I became very happy with my patterns. And so now I'm, I'm willing to start approaching the the stores for wholesale orders because I'm like, I know this is going to sell. I've already fit this on a number of women plus size and misses because I go up to a size 20. Um, and, and so that's an easier sell for me than just saying like, oh, it fits me. So I know it's going to sell. And also colors like I've gotten now that I have a, a steady stream of customers um, ordering on my website, they'll say, oh, can you make this? You know, we need more casual things. We need this. We, um, I don't like the red. The red doesn't sell very much. So I know what sells. <laughs> that is, and so I focus yeah. on that. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was finished. <laughs> oh, well, I just wanted to say like, That's brilliant. And I love the way you kind of pitched it. You're like, I used my customer as a fit model and you went through um, and it was almost like this product validation and research phase that you did super, super in depth by actually going out there in the real flesh and blood, like doing the pop up shops, talking to your customer, getting their feedback, making the tweaks. Um, I, I love that so much. And so you know, did you like, how did you figure out how to do these pop up shops? And like, especially like you were living in New York, you said you did one in San Francisco. Did you how did you even kind of approach that? Well, I tried to figure out who what shops had my customers, but weren't direct competitors. Um, So most of the clothing, um, the apparel stores, you know, they just sell 
regular apparel, when I approached them, they didn't seem that interested in what, what I had to sell. Cause they're like, Oh, I have a few busty customers, but yeah, not that many. So, I mean, it's a good concept, but you know, good luck to you, but no thanks. Um, so then I, I think I might have read an article about full bus lingerie and that there were stores that just sold D and higher lingerie. I said, maybe I should approach them because they have lingerie. I have clothes. So we're not competing. And in fact, we're, um, you know, we have synergy in that, you know, somebody who's my customer will go there and yeah. they might buy a bra or two and get a bra fitting. So it was like a win-win for the both of us. And so, um, I, I found that, um, Stores in the Midwest were a little bit more open. Um, they were more likely to respond. And I think part of it is that most of those stores are run by, you know, a, a woman who has, you know, so it's easier to get to the decision maker. There aren't like layers of bureaucracy because I contacted mm. a few places in New York, um, but they were sort of um, uh, chains, like lingerie chains. And, and though some of them did get back to me, it was sort of like, you know, we're only doing this with the brands that we only carry. And um, so it was a lot harder. So I said, you know, if, if, if it's not working out in New York, then, you know, I have to go somewhere else. And I'm from the Midwest uh, originally. So, um, you know, getting out there is not a problem for me. And so I started doing these pop-up shops and, I was able to talk with the owners as well. Um, even though they sold lingerie, you know, they had, some of them had worked in um, apparel shops before. So they sort of gave me advice on pricing. Um, they said, okay, we'll carry a few of your shirts and just, you know, see what the customers think. And I was able to get feedback from the shop owners as well as the customers. So it, it was, it was a, that part was, the educational part. So I would say the first two years was sort of learning how to actually do things, <laughs> um, learning about the business, learning about fashion. Um, and then sort of the third year was, um, you know, refining and, and finalizing the pattern and then figuring out what the store owners were looking for and what price points they're looking for. Um, because some of them said that, you know, my customers will not pay this amount of money for what you're selling. Even though this is a nice shirt, it's well-made. I love that it's made in the USA, but you're going to want to rethink your pricing. Mm. What um, was your price range at that point? Um, well, it started at... Um, my advice in the beginning, uh, was the first year I was in business, I had a mentor and she'd work for mostly luxury brands. So she said, okay, price them at $99. That'll be wonderful. But that's like a New York price. <laughs> um, and so, and I should have known better because coming from the Midwest, you know, I, I understand that, I'll, you know, given the, the current, um, political and economic climate, a lot of people are hurting. And so somebody's spending a hundred dollars on a shirt. I mean, may work in the coast because people in the coastal areas tend to have, you know, a little bit more expendable income. Um, but that might not necessarily be the truth in middle America where they've seen just exorbitant job loss. Um, so that's where I was getting a lot of pushback uh, about my pricing. So they started at 99 and made in the USA. And now I'm think I'm in talks with, uh, someone who, who works with Chinese manufacturers to get the price down. Okay. Um, it's, it's, um, I wanted to stay here, but my, I've learned through all this market research and talking to store owners is that my customers are very price conscious. So, um, and you know, like you said, you spent two, if not arguably three years kind of learning and doing research, but now you're figure, you've figured out sort of exactly the product that they want and the price that it needs to be at. And now, after all that time, after three years is when you're finally deciding, okay, I'm going to look at going overseas, which I love how much you took your time with it because, you know, I talk to people sometimes who they just have their, their idea stage and they're like already ready to start contacting manufacturer um, factories and uh, sewing contractors overseas to go into production. And it's kind of like, whoa, 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 put on the brakes. So, you mm -hmm. know, it sounds like to you, part of it was a, a personal thing, um, and I don't know if it's an ethical or whatever it is that you wanted to stay in the U.S., but, you know, 
did you think strategically, like, I'm going to start small, I'm going to go slow, I'm going to really research this out and talk to my customer instead of diving in, just getting all this product made and then throwing it at the wall and seeing if it's stuck? Did you, Were you really strategic about your process to go so slow? Oh, absolutely. Oh. And it was because I didn't have a fashion background. And, mm. and I think if I had of, you know, worked, the other thing about New York is very competitive. I, I applied for not unpaid internships <laughs> at different brands, but because I'm up against FIT and Parsons grads for these unpaid internships, you know, I never, no one ever contacted me, not even for an interview. Mm. Um, because I wanted to get that learning experience, but, you know, it just didn't happen. So I said, you know, I'm going to do this slow. I'm not going to rush into this because what the last thing I wanted to do, and I've heard horror stories is, you know, go to China, um, get 1500 pieces made and you bring it back to your customer and they hate it. So yeah. you've got 1500 pieces of something. And then also them knowing that I don't, that I'm new to this. You know, so imagine if somebody I'm making, you know, 30 pieces and they, they think or they know I'm new to this and, you know, they at first kind of mess up and don't take me seriously. And then I get it and I find out I'm overcharged later. It's just a drop in the bucket. It's not, you know, I, I, I shelled out $10,000 or $5,000 for something. It's, you know, more like a few hundred, maybe a thousand. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge loss if that happens on a smaller scale. But now, you know, now that I'm talking to um, Chinese manufacturers or liaisons to Chinese manufacturers, mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing. So yeah. when they come at me with something with a price or, you know, the stakes are higher now because my orders are bigger. Um, and also I'm going to be approaching stores now. So they have to be on point like they can't. And so because I'm talking to them in a way that I know what I'm doing, I've done this before, you can go to my website and see that I have things on there and that the, the garments look good. Um, and know that, you know, you're not going to come with to me with a faulty product that's overpriced um, because I know what I've paid for it before. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I also have more contacts with people. I can say, hey, this guy's telling me, you know, the cut and sew price in China is going to be this for these pieces. And they'll come back to me and say, oh, wow, that's a really good price. Or they might <laughs> say, oh, that sounds a little bit expensive. You know, see if you can bargain him down. Um, and another example was um, I needed... You know, they always, one of the things I learned is always have a copy of your pattern um, because people sometimes will hold it hostage because they know you need it. Um, and also they get lost. So if you have that master copy of the pattern, you can always get it copied and you can send it off to all the sewers and pattern makers and graders and all of that. Um, and so when I approached um, this person who was the Chinese manufacturing liaison, I asked, um, oh, I would like a copy of the pattern. How much do you charge for a copy of, of the pattern? And he charged, he mentioned something that was double what I had paid in the past. So I knew, I'm like, okay, this guy, I'm going to have to really watch him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I said, oh, that seems a little high. That's okay. I'll have, I'll have my, you know, my friend do it. Yeah. Um, so now when I get quote, price quotes from him, it's, you know, fair. <laughs> so. Oh, I love, that's so great. Um, and where did you find the liaison for the Chinese factories? Um, actually, it was kind of random. I was looking for um, fabric, uh -huh. and this person also sold fabric. Okay. And so when I went to his office to take a look at some fabric swatches, I noticed he had some sewers in the back. And I said, oh, you know, do you, do you manufacture here? And he's like, oh, yeah, we have manufacturers in India. We also have some in China. And I said, oh. And, you know, he's a good salesman. So he's like, yeah, this shirt, you know, this shirt, we, you know, we would charge you this amount for it. And I said, oh, that's a, you know, that's a very good price. And I was thinking about going overseas anyway. So I said, okay, well, we'll test you out. I want you to make a sample for me and we'll go from there. And I think that's the best way to talk to them because if you, like what you were saying, like if you, you know, have a prototype and then you dive into it really quick, yeah. they can smell that desperation. Yeah. But if you're more like, um, let's test you out. Let's see how you do first, you know, and then, and then we'll go from there. Then all of a sudden you get a better product because they know you're not desperate and they know you're not rushing. Yeah. 
that yeah, they can totally sense that desperation, and I I don't even know if I would say desperation because that almost puts a negative tone on it. But it's almost like the excitement to get to the finish line, and I think for a lot of designers, that finish line is like having the production in hand, like ready to put it in the market, and so they can sense that excitement, which is easy to. Um, you can get so excited that you're going to move so fast that, like you said, you miss all these things. You start getting taken advantage of. And so it's a matter mm-hmm. of having the self-discipline to put on the brakes and say, no, let's test this out. I'm going to get a prototype first. I'm going to get a sample first to make sure we're a good fit. Um, and, of course, there's mistakes and you learn along the way. But I think having the patience on your own self to take a breath and slow down and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure it's done right is huge. Yes, and I think over the long run, it's even though it's been sort of slow to really launch my my company. Yeah. Um, I think in the long run, it's it's better this way. Yeah. Um, particularly for someone who doesn't um, have a background in um, in fashion and sort of the business aspect of it. I mean, we all wear clothes, but you know, running a fashion company is a whole nother ball game. <laughs> <laughs> or any company for that matter. Yeah, it's very, very true. Um, and it takes time to build a really good solid foundation, which is what you're building. Um, instead of just putting some stuff out there, you've spent the time to make sure it's right and to talk to your customer. And you actually already have a nice base of people who are your fans and who like your product and who are buying from you. And that can just make everything from here on forward easier. Um, so where are you at right now then? You're talking to someone in China and are, are you going into production over there or what's happening? Well, I have a few items that are in production at this moment in the U S and, um, as a small business sort of balancing, you know, inventory, you know, you don't want to have too much inventory, (laughs) <laughs> but you also don't want to have too little. So it's like this this difficult balancing act sometimes. And so I had some long sleeve shirts made several months ago and they sold out really quickly, um, which, you know, is good for me, but not good, you know, for the customer. Um, and so after this production in the U.S. of the long sleeve shirts, I'm going to look into manufacturing in, in China. Okay. But I just didn't want to have, like, too much going on. Also, financially, I'm a small business, so I don't have, like, you know, copious amounts of money to say, okay, we'll just do this production real quick in the U.S., and then I'll go and do a big production in, in China. So yeah. Um, but then, you know, if I sell out really quickly of these, which I'm actually anticipating that I will, um, then I need to get on the move. <laughs> uh, so talk a little bit about that and like your success with direct to consumer, because that's fantastic to be able to run a production, uh, do a run of production, and then it sells out really fast. And um, I mean, as much as that's a problem, because you, you, you're like, I could sell more, and my customer wants more, that's that's arguably a good problem to have. So, you know, you did these pop-up shops, and then how did you get these people to keep coming back to your site and buying more or get new people to your site? Like, how have you strategized that? Uh, Well, I did, I've done Google AdWords and I will probably start doing that again. Um, One thing about marketing is kind of like a black hole. Like you don't know what works and what doesn't work. And it can also be very expensive. So you're sort of testing out all these different channels. Um, And so I found that Social media has been really good, um, and it's free. And sometimes I do ads, like I'll do a $5 push on, you know, a post about, you know, my shirts, or I'll do a po- uh, a boost of, you know, the pop-up shop. And I, I find that when I do a pop-up shop in a certain city, like a week later, I'll get a couple of orders from that particular city or someplace nearby. So it's I feel like a lot of it is word of mouth. And I also have a newsletter as well. And it's like very prominent on my website. It's easy to sign up for. And when I do the pop-up shops, I always have like a newsletter sign-up sheet because again, it's like free. And whenever I have new products or I have, you know, a sale going on like for Black Friday, I always send out the newsletter and then, you know, I get like a few sales just from that. Sure. Um, 
So, but you know, right now my budget is pretty tight for marketing, um, but I find I've been getting a lot of repeat customers and I'm going to start revisiting um, ways. uh, You know, I found that when someone writes about me, um, like a feature in a newspaper, um, that really helps as well. Um, But, you know, those things can be very, very expensive. So um, you also have to be strategic. I've, I've sent like free shirts. There was a woman in Australia who contacted me and she runs a Instagram page and she's a full bust woman. And she said, Oh, I would love to, you know, model your clothes. And, you know, if you could send me, you know, some samples. So I sent her one of my, my short sleeve shirts and she took some fantastic photographs and she put them on Instagram. And from that I got, you know, 30 or 40 new Instagram followers. Um, so, Right now, it's like more of like sort of inexpensive ways to market. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the future, I'm definitely um, going to look into because, you know, you can't do those types of marketing things and grow really big. You know, it's it takes a lot of money, but there are strategic things that, that you can do. Um, also, partnerships um, with other brands, um, you can sort of split the cost in, in marketing and, and run ads that feature both you know, both brands. So, um, you know, you just (laughs) work with what you have. So would that be maybe like an example of like, if you were doing the pop-up shop at a lingerie store that also serviced full busted women that you guys could sort of maybe pool and do some promotion for that since it's going to be benefiting both of you is, would that be an example? Yes, I have done that. I have, um, we have gone in half, um, for, for like a Facebook boost. Um, also I have, uh, marketing cards made, um, uh, for the pop-ups that I send to the stores and they, in like a month before, and they'll start, you know, putting them in the ladies bags, mm. you know, when they buy something That's and, smart. um, one person, they, um, one shop made a, a nice poster and she put it on her storefront and was handing out the postcards. Um, I have like gone a day early and grabbed a couple of those postcards. And, you know, anytime I was in a shop or something, I would just like hand them out to people. Um, I also carry postcards in my, in my purse, you know, of my brand. And if I start talking to somebody, even like an Uber driver, I'm like, yeah, you can check out my, my brand. So these are like, you know, each postcard costs me like 10 cents to make. So, um, yeah, it's very inexpensive way, you know, to market. Um, and then always just try to wear your clothes. And I've had people, even in my apartment building, um, I was wearing one of my shirts and it's like, Oh wow, that fits you really nicely. Where'd you get that from? (laughs) And I whipped out one of my postcards and I was like, I make them myself. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, you always there's. A, I think it was Will Smith that said, "If you if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready." <laughs> um, and so you just always have to be on. You know, always have to be prepared. Always have your postcards. Try to wear your things as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, make sure that you're posting like relevant content that people actually want to like and share and not, you know, unfollow you because you're like spamming them with, you know, Oh, there's a sale. There's a sale. Like every day. It's like, you know, a lot of my content is for, you know, I'm trying to help full bust women in terms of how they fashion, you know, whether it's bra fitting or, or, or different styles that look good on a full bus, you know, it's informational content and not just spamming with like, here's my brand, here's my brand, here's my brand. And here's a sale, you know, um, it's like we already know about your brand. <laughs> it's good. No, it's good to always think about like how you can provide value. It's not all about selling. It's about building a relationship and becoming a trusted resource um, because you have knowledge and you can share other things that will help them out. And then three months from now or six months from now, whenever it is, when they're they're ready to make a purchase, like you're going to be the person that they think of. Um, so that's great. Yeah. And actually that happened. I had a big Black Friday sale because I was testing, you know, sort of my made in China pricing. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's see how, you know, what will make some new people bite, you know, with the price. So I really reduced the prices, even of things that sell well, you know, just to kind of test. And somebody who, and I recognize the last name, it was a very distinctive last name, someone who likes and comments on my Facebook post bought something from me for the first time. That's great. And I think, 
Yeah, she. I think she had been. It's been like a few months that she's been liking things. Yeah. Um. So people, you know, they really are watching, and you know, like I said, that kind of growth is very slow, but I think it's more sustainable. You know, because I've been featured in. I was featured once in the Daily Mail, which is you know it's huge, you know newspaper, lots of readership, and I got so many hits and not that many sales. But then in other um, other magazines, I was featured. I got way less hits, but m- like more sales, comparatively speaking. Um, so it's all about like finding that you know where your audience and where your customers are reading and targeting it to them. Well, because any publication yeah, is going to say like, um, you know, oh, well, we'll take your money for an ad. Like we have all these readers that will buy your things. It's like, no, you have to do your homework on that. <laughs> like how many readers are women? Um, how many of them are willing to pay this kind of money for, you know, for what you're selling and, and go from there? Um, no. And that's such a great point, because um, something that I wanted to sort of ask you about is is you're very, very niche. Like you're servicing a very specific woman and you have, I think, what do you have? You have short sleeve and long sleeve button downs. Am I roughly button downs, but like woven tops. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So that's super, super niche. Um, and, and, and it, Sounds like that that's exactly kind of what you experienced with some of the features or ads that you've run is, you know, Daily Mail. Yeah, as much as they have a huge reach, they kind of talk to everybody versus maybe Mm -hmm. a smaller publication that has a very specific audience. It could be, you know, 1% the size, but you are talking to a very specific customer. And so I would love for you to just spend a minute kind of talking about I don't know, you know, I know obviously you're solving a very specific problem for yourself with your product, but did you think about how niche you were being? Because this is something that um, I hear people say all the time, I want to make a, I want to have a fashion line that runs from extra, extra, extra small through 6X, and I want to kind of like make a product for everybody, and to me, that's such a weird concept, but I think people Mm. get really scared that if they are too niche, that there's not enough people to sell to, Um, so can you talk about that a little bit uh, in terms of how you've done that with your brand and and how that's worked for you well? Yeah, so, you know, when I was doing my research about out, you know, specifically how many, you know, because everyone in my family is pretty busty, you know, like genetics, <laughs> but, you know, not, you know, not everybody is. So I was like, how do I quantify this? How do I know if I even have a business if there's, you know, a, a good number of women that, that, you know, can use my product. And so I looked at sales of bras and I sort of extrapolated what percentage, like did like a conservative estimate and a um, a liberal estimate of what percentage of these bras sold every year as D and higher. And then talking to the the lingerie stores, they're like, oh, yeah, my average bra size is, that is sold here is like an H cup or a G cup or an F cup. Like they were all in the, the bigger sizes. And then I was reading... Um, like the lingerie journal and all these um, online publications and all of them say like, we need more bigger cup bras. We need not just plus size, but also full cup bras. So clearly like, it seems like fashion hasn't quite caught up to the needs of, of women. And so I started out um, just wanting to do full cup and misses sizes because I thought there's so many plus size brands out there. You know, there's not really anyone doing what I'm doing, especially in the U S um, there's a bigger, a big company in over in Britain, but you know, that's Britain and it's a different aesthetic and there's international shipping and whatnot. So I said, there's really not anybody in the U S and I wanted to stay away from plus size. Cause I thought I'm going to be competing with everybody else. Mm. But then as I started doing um, the pop-ups, I started realizing that even though there are these plus size brands, plus size women still have a huge problem finding clothes that are made well and that don't look like grandma. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I want to expand to plus size. But when you try to expand and, and, and be the brand for everybody, you, you, you tend to not be good for one. 
Um, and to explain further, um, you can't just take a size six shirt and scale up to a size 26. Right. Um, not everything's going to work. And, you know, I, I have friends who are plus size and they've showed me pictures of, yeah, see, I bought this shirt and I don't know why they chose this material because it's unflattering. And that's why, you know, for my picture, I had to cut it off at, you know, the neck down because it just didn't look good. I don't even know why I bought this shirt. Um, and so you can't just, you know, take the same thing you would sell on a six and think it's going to be fine for, for a size 26. So um, there's a few uh, items that I sell on my website that look good on both. And I fit, you know, the size 20 and it looks good. And I fit the size six and it looks good. Um, but there are other ones where I would make one pattern that's like a size 10 and then another pattern that's a size 18 and then kind of see if there's any changes that need to be made to either one based on, you know, using two different fit models. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really important because I, especially in the lingerie industry, I see it all the time where there, and I also feel like um, it's, it's kind of a shallow pandering almost with some of these brands like look at us we do plus size we have a a, a plus size model or yeah. we have a woman of color that's a model and I think Rihanna came out recently when, when someone asked her why she didn't have transgender models and she's like I'm not using them as a prop you know these are you know real people and you know I think it's I think it does a disservice when you just look at people like they're you know, a prop or a token. It's like, you know, if I'm going to do plus sizes, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to do my research and I'm going to fit people and I'm going to make sure that the fabric works. I'm just not going to take what I have and say, oh, look, I'm great. I'm a, a, a pat myself on the back. I'm doing, you know, a size 26 is now. It can almost look like a marketing gimmick, like some, like I think you made yeah. a comment, these big brands, they, you know, because this has been a, a hot topic for a few years now. I know Amy Schumer's been a really big advocate, um, and there's there's some other big celebrities, but it's not like you can just pump out some plus size clothes and then check the box. It's it's not that easy. Um, like you said, if you're going to do it, do it. Do the research. Talk to the customer. Make sure it works for them. Make sure it's the right fabric. It's the right fit. Um, and that's where it can be really hard to do everything for everybody because if you really want to do right. it right, it takes a lot of work. Um I mean, you spent three years kind of perfecting just these couple items for a very specific market, which I think is phenomenal um, and I, I, I think takes a, a, an insane amount of patience and self-discipline to, to go that slow. But in the long run, is going to pay off tenfold. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm I'm definitely glad I did it that way. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad because one of the things that, that some of my plus size friends said was, and and this goes just in general. People are not stupid, and people know when it's a cheap pandering. Yeah. Um. So you know, if they buy my brand, I want to make sure that you know they know that they're getting a quality piece that I took the time to do. That's going to create repeat customers. Yeah. And it's like that with me. You know, if I you know, go to a store, and you know someone tries to sell me something that's not that great, I'm going to remember that, and I'm not going to go back. Yeah. But if I go to a store and the person tells me like, oh, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't get that. You know, this is going to fit you much better. It's much higher quality. And then I try it on and I'm like, you know, you're absolutely right. This is good. Thank you for not trying to just sell me anything. Um, I'm more likely to go back and buy something. It's exactly like those factories you talked about at the beginning where you went to them and you, you know, you felt initially that they were trying to take advantage of you. And then once you noticed that the samples and the construction weren't coming in right and you pointed all those things out, they were maybe willing to make the corrections at that point. But by then you said your mouth was already sour and you and you were like, I'm done. I'm going to go somewhere else. And so it's a very similar type of experience, I think, that you then as a designer start to create and build and nurture with your audience and your um, your your customers. Um, on that note, a little bit off topic, but you made a comment earlier that I wanted to ask about, and I don't know if you're comfortable sharing exact numbers, but maybe you can give us a range. Um, you said that on Black Friday, you tested the China pricing. And so I would be super curious to know... Um, you know, if you want to get Everlane with us and be transparent about your uh, your costs, you know, what did you find in terms of the minimums that you were getting for U.S. made versus the 
price per piece versus how much you then had to sell it for compared to going overseas. Um, would you be willing to share some of those numbers? Um, a, a little bit, sort okay. of like just, I would say in more vague terms. Sure. So um, I pay, let's see, about five times more in the cut and sew cost. No, actually, more than that, probably seven times, because they include fabric. Okay. Um, manufacturing in overseas versus manufacturing in the U.S. Um, the majority of the cost comes from the labor, obviously, because, you know, we there's a higher cost of living. There's a higher minimum wage. Um, usually, the employees have, have benefits and whatnot, so... That's a big thing. And the other big thing is is the fabric. Um, And they are able to source, in China, since they're big factories, they are able to source fabric at a cheaper cost, even if you have smaller runs. Versus me, if I were to approach, um, you know, just as a brand and I need a roll of fabric, it's going to cost a lot more. Um, So it's, it's sort of like when you go through a larger company, um, even though you might pay, say, a middleman or something a little bit more, you're, that middleman is working with a ton of other factories and they have a relationship with them, so they get a better price than you would. Right. Um, so sometimes it, it works out, but, you know, you could you have to do your homework and, and see. But, um, yeah, my fabric costs were pretty high here because I went through the um, Japanese distributor. Um, but then when I went to the the Chinese factory with the, pretty much the same fabric. They're like, oh, yeah, we can get it for half. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, you so can. you were able to cut your fabric. And shipping. <laughs> shipping, what shipping? Shipping from overseas to you to distribute or? Well, because it's a Chinese manufacturer, the fabric is already in China. So the shipping cost is like negligible as opposed to, you know, when they would have to ship the fabric to my manufacturer in the U.S., it was very expensive. Gotcha. Okay, so your fabric from U.S. to China was about half. And then clarify the seven times thing again. So like if you were paying, if you were paying, um, and for just quick, easy numbers, if you got something cut and sewn in China for $1, you were paying $7 in the U.S. to get it cut and sewn? Yeah. Roughly. Or, or, you know, like say, you know, $10, um, you know, in China, and that's including fabric. Okay. Um, versus say, anywhere from 40 to $70 in the U S depending on how much you make. Wow. But also in China, you know, you need, you need to have a higher quantities yeah. as well. So, so if like, I were to approach, but even if I approach and I've, I've gotten pricing on larger quantities, it didn't bring down the cut and sew price that much. Okay. You got larger quantity pricing here in the States. Mm-hmm. And so what have you found? Are you comfortable sharing what the minimums are that you're looking at in China? Um, well, in China, usually for a first time order, you can't go lower than a thousand. Okay. But I've heard because a lot of manufacturing is moving to Vietnam or uh, Myanmar, Haiti, even, um, there's a lot more competition. So sometimes, you know, they're willing to go, I mean, for the good factories, um, they're willing to go lower than that. Um, but, you know, I would caution that before you put in a big order, make sure that you know, they make a sample, um, they make samples of all the sizes, and then maybe even do just a small run of maybe 50 to 100 pieces that you you check mm-hmm. um, before, you know, because if they're bad, you can just pay them for the 100 pieces and go on your merry way, right. as opposed to, you know, paying for a 1000 pieces and being like hugely out of pocket. Yeah. And then you have a 1000 things that you can't sell. Yeah. Now, so, you know, that's me being like slow and cautious, <laughs> which again is very smart. Um, so, you know, congratulations on that. Cause it's, it, I mean, I even have a hard time with certain things being slow and cautious. It takes a lot of self-discipline. Like I said earlier, we're so excited sometimes to get to the finish line. Um, but we have to enjoy the journey as well. Um, and then just as a word of caution, can you like, are you getting DDP, um, 
delivered duty paid or LDP, landed duty paid, pricing versus FOB, freight on board, and just kind of talking about importing the product and, you know, not um, – because sometimes, and, and I don't know how far you are into your um, sourcing overseas or if maybe your liaison is handling all of this for you. But one thing that can be a big surprise is you or- place this order with the factory and it really only pays for the order to be made and then to get to the port in China. And then right. from the port to get it on the boat over the water to the port in the U.S., then from the port to your office, which may be, you know, a big shipment, and then paying duties and customs. Um, You also have, like, insurance and stuff in there. So have you gotten to that phase yet? No. Okay. Um, I I haven't. But, you know, I will say that when I, whenever, and this is important, whenever you communicate with somebody, um, what I say is, okay, this is the total price that I am paying. That is it. This includes landed, everything. And make sure you get everything in writing mm-hmm. so that, you know, they can't backtrack and say, no, no, no. That I'm like, nope, here's the email. Like, I, <laughs> it's right here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not to that point yet, but I, you know, I know about the different shipping. And I, and I always say, like, all I'm paying you is this price for everything, including shipping and getting it to my office. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then make sure you get it in, in writing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. That's smart. Um, so this is a really exciting journey, Kristen, and congratulations on your successes so far. Um, you have so much more to come, I know, and have done such a great job of building this amazing foundation. Um, where can everybody find you and what you're doing online? Well, um, I sell primarily through my website, which is www.exclusivelychristen.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter um, at Exclusively Chris, on Facebook and Instagram, and both of those are just um, Exclusively Kristen. Uh, I'm also in a store in Pittsburgh called Lavana Bratique and a store in Toronto called Brat Lingerie. And Brat Lingerie sells uh, lingerie specifically for D-cup and higher women. Um, so I'm working on getting into more stores, but for now, those are the two. And then obviously on my website, um, you can purchase from there. Awesome. And that's great. And you, um, you are not the first sort of D cup and up or full busted guest I've had on the show. It's a, it's a, it is a very underserved market and it's this, um, myth i don't know if myth myth is not the right word but this misnomer that the average woman is a 34c that is not the size Uh -uh. (laughs) Um, or even a 36c it is very far off um so thank you for you know helping out a sector of the um of our our world that i think gets kind of underserved so thank you for that um i will end with the question i ask everybody at the end of the show and that is what is the one thing people never ask you about working in the fashion industry but you wish they did oh that's a tough one um just how do you stay patient Um, because I think with the fashion industry, even if I were a lot more, you know, quick about doing things, it still takes time. You know, manufacturing takes time, delays take time, or, you know, there are always delays, things happen. Sometimes the fabric is delivered someplace where it's not supposed to, or, you know, stuff happens. Um, so you always have to be patient, but at the same time, you know, when you're a small company or when you're new, sometimes people, like I said, will take advantage of you and they will push your order to the side. So there's this balance of like, of being patient and understanding that things happen, but also of staying on top of things and making sure that people are, are doing what they're supposed to do. Um, so I think how I stay just patient is I'm always learning and I'm always reading. Um, and, you know, even though I work with one factory, you know, I'm always making connections. Um, so I'm just not sitting there kind of, you know, twiddling my thumbs like, oh, when is this production going to be going to be done? Um, I am out 
actively, you know, contacting journalists and contacting different people and networking and, um, you know, doing pop-up shops and, you know, all different things. So it's like, you know, you have to keep your mind busy, but then also, you know, check up on your, on your sewers and making sure like, okay, do you have everything that you need? Okay. You said you would be done at this time, you know, um, you know, what's going on and just calling them up and just being present because if you're not present, all of a sudden they forget about you. (laughs) It's a big balancing act, but the patience thing is, is a great sort of ending note. I mean, that's something that came up a bunch of times throughout our conversation and, um, Um, I think that's a really great tip to go slow, take your time, and, you know, like we've said, have the self-discipline to make sure you you do it right, um, which does take time. So thank you so much for chatting with me today, Kristen. It was lovely to have you on the show, and I appreciate you sharing your story with everybody listening. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. I appreciate each and every one of you. Make sure to hit subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening. And if you enjoyed this show, I'd be super appreciative if you took 30 seconds to leave a rating or review on iTunes. You can do that at sfdnetwork.com slash review. I'll also remind you of our newly launched Patreon page, which is available at patreon.com slash sfd. Everything's absolutely free, and it is your exclusive way to see who is going to be coming up on the podcast and submit your questions to get answered. Hear some of my internal dialogues and reflections on working in this industry about things like anxiety or imposter syndrome or even tricks and strategies I've used and I've seen others use to launch their label, work their way up in their career, or get ahead in their freelance journey. We'll also be sharing tons of behind the scene and bonus content like mini clips from podcast interviews that we do on site where we capture some video clips as well as small bite sized interviews from trade show floors or random outings where we just have a chance to get a five minute interview with a really awesome person. So check that out at patreon.com slash SFD. And thank you so much again, you guys, for listening. I love being here with you every week and I'll see you next week. Bye bye.